In this video, we're going to begin the last major topic of this unit, dealing with the properties of gases. So far, we've spoken mostly of our condensed phases, solids and liquids. We've also talked about the fact that their properties are very different than those of properties of gases. Our job now is to start introducing you to those differences so that we can understand all three states of matter collectively. Before we begin, we'll start with an overview of what we'll talk about. Uh, first of all, we'll discuss the general characteristics that gases have. We discussed this back in the first video of the unit, but as always, I want these ideas to be fresh in your mind. The majority of our video, then, is going to focus on the measurable properties or characteristics that gases have, and those are going to be volume, pressure, temperature, and the amount of gas present. We'll talk about what each of these is, we'll talk about why gases have these characteristics, and then finally, we'll talk about the units that we measure each of these in. Uh, amount of gas and uh, volume are going to be relatively simple. We'll talk about temperature units and pressure units more specifically, as there are many different types of units we can potentially use. So to start, let's deal with those general characteristics or general properties that all gases tend to have. Over on the right, you can see an animation playing showing what gases look like as they move inside of a tank. And on the left, we can see the descriptions that describe that behavior. We have fast moving particles. There are relatively large distances separating those particles. And those large distances cause intermolecular forces to be very, very weak. Most intermolecular forces are electromagnetic in nature, and magnets get much, much weaker in strength the further the particles are apart. So this is the properties we tend to see at the atomic level, as envisioned again by the animation. What this creates is properties that we can then appreciate at our level, the macro scale. Gases have extremely low density due to the large distances separating the particles. Gases have very indefinite shapes and indefinite volumes. They will take on the shape of their container like liquids do, but they will also take on the volume of their container. You can take the same quantity of gas and put it inside of a balloon, and that same quantity of gas can fill up an entire football stadium. This, again, is due to the fact that there are large distances separating those particles, and we can squish those distances closer together if necessary. Tied to all this, we can also think of gases as being very compressible. We can take a large volume gas and squeeze it into a relatively small space. Uh, again, something we can't do with solids and we can't do with liquids because they're pretty much already as close together as they can be. Now that we've identified what those general characteristics are, we can talk about the properties we can measure about a gas. The first of which is that's pretty much unique to gases is the unit of pressure. Pressure is a word that we've all probably heard before, but having it actually uh, defined in a chemical sense is something I think that's going to be a little bit new. Uh, first of all, we'll describe pressure as a force that is being exerted, and it's a force that those gas particles exert on the container that they are in. What's probably more new information is that this force is exerted on the walls via collisions. As each of the individual particles collides with the wall of the container, they're going to bounce off of that wall and exert the force that we're talking about. If you remember back to your physics classes, these collisions require that your particle is undergoing some sort of change in direction. And change in direction, just like a change in velocity, is a form of acceleration. If we have an acceleration going on, we can think of our equation F equals MA. The particles are accelerating due to the change in direction. There is a mass associated with each individual particle, and if there's a mass that's undergoing an acceleration, there must necessarily be a force exerted. Over here in the diagram in the bottom corner, we can see that force being exerted. Each time there's a collision, there's a very tiny force pushing outwards on the side of the tank. And the sum of these very tiny forces is what we measure as the unit of pressure. The next unit we'll talk about as a measurable property of a gas is the volume that the gas takes up, the three-dimensional space that the gas basically occupies. Uh, and this three-dimensional space, uh, unlike solids and liquids, is not determined by the actual gas itself, but is actually determined simply by the size of the container. I can put any quantity of gas in this container that I like. If I change the amount of gas, it might affect other variables, but because the container is made of steel and is inchangeable, the volume will stay the same. We have a unit for that volume, and unlike things like pressure and temperature, this unit's pretty consistent. We'll be measuring the volumes of gases in the units of liters. The next property is another simple one. Uh, we can also measure the amount of gas present, and this amount of gas present is typically measured as the number of gas particles that are present in our sample. Uh, and just like we've talked about earlier in the year, when you're trying to measure numbers of gas particles, 
The easiest way to do that is to count them in units of moles. Moles, again, are counting of atoms, but in groups as opposed to individual, just like we count eggs in dozens. The last of our measurable properties, then, is going to be the uh, property of temperature. Uh, temperature, as we've talked about a couple times in this unit, is a measure of the average kinetic energy of all the particles in your gas sample. And generally speaking, then, raising temperature generally means we have faster moving particles. Uh, that doesn't mean every single particle is moving faster, uh, but on average, they will be going more quickly. An interesting characteristic of temperature that's going to come into play in a moment is the idea of absolute zero. Uh, this is a concept that wasn't originally obvious to scientists, but was discovered eventually that there is a lowest possible temperature out there in the world. If temperature is simply average kinetic energy, there has to come a point in time where there is no kinetic energy left, basically a point in time where all atomic motion has stopped we actually have the ability to get substances relatively close to absolute zero within a fraction of a degree, uh, which is a peculiar idea because how do you cool something down that's the coolest thing in the world without something cooler to actually make the cooling process happen? Uh, one of the ways of doing it, but not the only way, uh, is using something that's shown in the picture over here to the right. Uh, in this situation, a group of lasers is used um, to cause certain atoms to absorb energy and then release that energy in the form of a photon. If your lasers are tuned properly, when the atom releases that energy as a photon, it's going to lose a little bit of momentum, which means it's going to lose a little bit of its velocity or kinetic energy. The loss of that kinetic energy eventually translates into a lower and lower temperature until eventually you get that temperature down to almost as low as they can be. Scientists are very interested in doing these things because at these super duper low temperatures, we have some very interesting physical properties of substances going on that we normally can't see because those properties are hidden under the fact that there's all this kinetic energy bouncing around. Learning about those properties helps us understand the fundamental characteristics of matter as a whole and hopefully leads to um, new technologies and new materials uh, that allow our world around us to operate even better. Now you might be curious as to how cold this absolute zero actually is. Uh, the temperature scale we're most familiar with is the Fahrenheit scale. We're talking about negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit, so pretty darn cold. The scientific scale we typically use for measuring these things is uh, the Celsius scale. Absolute zero is at negative 273 Celsius. Uh, but you might notice that the interesting one of these uh, is the last scale we'll be dealing with. I think we talked back in the beginning of the year of the Kelvin scale of temperature. And in the Kelvin scale, we can see that absolute zero is zero Kelvin. This is why the Kelvin scale was created. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So let's wrap this video up then by discussing the units of pressure and temperature. Uh, as we said earlier, pressure is a force that can be expressed in many different types of units. So talking about it in the slide where we had pressure wasn't really practical. Uh, as a result of these many different units, unit conversion is a common problem when dealing with pressure calculations. Typically the units have to agree with one another and converting in and out of the units of certain pressure, pressure units is what's going to be required. On the left here, we have a table of different pressure units that are available to us. Some of these pressure units are used more commonly than others. I would say the single most common unit we'll be using is atmospheres. It's built off of our atmosphere on the planet. One atmosphere is normal atmospheric pressure. Zero atmospheres is a perfect vacuum. Uh, millimeters of mercury is also commonly used, uh, probably the second of the two of those. Uh, it has to do with old ways of measuring pressure. We used to use a device known as a manometer, which had a U-shaped tube filled with mercury, liquid mercury. As pressure changed on different sides of the tubes, we would see the U become uneven, and we would measure the difference in the two heights in millimeters, hence the term millimeters of mercury. Another unit that we see in this country very often is pounds per square inch, but you'll see it almost never uh, in this particular class. It's not a unit we typically do a lot of scientific calculations in, but it is a unit we use um, more commonly here in the United States. Now, as I mentioned, you will be expected to convert back and forth between these units. Over on the right, we have a bunch of conversion factors that will get the job done. All of these are related to the unit of atmospheres, which means all of these are related to one another. I can say that there are 14.7 psi for every 760 millimeters of mercury for every 101.325 kilopascals. So you can use any of these interconnected. 
when you're doing calculations on a test or in problems in the book, you'll be able you'll be asked to use these conversion factors. Uh, if you're doing things like for a lab where you just need to know the answer, you can also do all these conversions in Google. If you type in the numerical value and the unit of pressure you have, and then you say you want to convert it to the unit that you want, Google will be able to do those conversions for you automatically. Our other measurable property with complex unit is temperature. As we said before, temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy, but unfortunately there's a lot of different temperature scales out there, many of which were created to link to physical phenomena that existed in the world. The three temperature scales that we are going to deal with are going to be the Celsius scale, the Fahrenheit scale, and the Kelvin scale. I believe we saw these temperature conversions earlier in the year, but these are the equations that you're going to use to convert back and forth between the three of these. Now I mentioned that these temperature scales are typically linked to physical phenomenon. Uh, and depending on the time that these scales were made, what we thought was the right phenomenon to link these scales to changed pretty dramatically. The earliest of the temperature scales is this one right here, the Fahrenheit scale. Uh, and the Fahrenheit scale was made in a time where every temperature or every thermometer maker in the world had their own individual scale. Fahrenheit, so the person who was making these particular thermometers, had happened to make very, very good ones. And as a result, his thermometer became much more accepted than others, and his temperature scale eventually became adopted. Now, as science progressed, eventually we were able to create the Celsius scale. Uh, the Celsius scale had two major advantages over the Fahrenheit scale. First of all, it created uh, stop points at 0 and 100 degrees, creating a scale of 100 points, just like we see in the metric system. And it was linked to something very specific as opposed to the Fahrenheit, which is linked to the actual equipment. Celsius scale is linked to the melting point and the boiling point of water. Since so much science happens on our, on our planet with water, it made sense to link our, boy, our scale to that. Again, as our understanding of science continued, we eventually created the Kelvin scale to replace the Celsius scale. The discovery of the concept of absolute zero or lowest possible zero started having scientists ask, well, if there's a lowest possible zero, why would that temperature be zero on our measuring scale? And that's exactly what the Kelvin scale is. It takes the Celsius scale, same exact unit, and shifts the whole temperature down so that zero happens at absolute zero, meaning Kelvin temperatures only occur as positive numbers. We still use Celsius and Fahrenheit today uh, with the general public. Fahrenheit in our country, Celsius with pretty much every other country in the world. The scientific community, while still using Celsius, uh, uses much more the Kelvin scale because, again, it's the most scientifically reasonable way to measure temperature in the perspective of our entire universe. And that brings us to the end of our video today. Uh, as a result of what we talked about, you should be able to describe the general properties that gases have. This, again, was likely a review from our first video in this unit. You should also be able to describe the four major characteristics that we talk of with gases. Pressure, volume, the amount of gas present, temperature. And with each of those, you should be able to identify what this unit actually is and what, un and what units we use to measure those individual properties. Last but not least, you should be able to convert between the units of pressure as well as the units of temperature using either the conversion factors or the equations. Uh, all of those will always be provided for you. You simply need to know how to do those conversions.